today it's my pleasure to announce our last spe seminar speaker of the uh, semester, um, Dr. Tim Tinker. Um, Tim comes to us um, originally, he did his uh, undergraduate in Canada uh, at the University of Guelph, where he also then did his master's degree at the University of Waterloo. And something about not believing the pink blotters, I'm not quite certain <laughs> what that was all about, but I know Tim and I know not to ask. Uh, and then Tim went to UC Santa Cruz, um, where he did as a PhD with Jim Estes, um, working on uh, sea otter ecology, and we spent, Tim and I uh, met at Santa Cruz when I was also a student there. We were uh, in the lab together. I spent, got a chance to spend a lot of time um, in the field with Tim, particularly in the Aleutians. Um, really liked the kind of the way he thinks about things and approaches stuff. Um, and Tim finished up his uh, PhD at UC Santa Cruz, and then um, became actually Jim Estes, uh, which if you will, replacement, or he got the job with the USGS running the, uh, the co-op station there, where he's been now for 10 or 12 years. Something like that. Something years, and he Too takes long. on um, the kind of the hat of both uh, being a, a federal employee doing the Seattle stuff, but also advising way too many students. Um, and Tim's one of those people who's very active out in open door policy. For those of you who have had any interaction with him in the past, knows that he can almost always go to him and he'll drop what he's doing and, and work with you. He's really good, not only with Seattle College, in this case, field ecology, but with uh, mathematical kind of looking at data, running through um, modeling, MATLAB, and things like that. And so he really brought a nice uh, uh, set of tools to it. Um, I really had a good time uh, working with Tim um, in the field and in, and in grad school, and I'd really like to see them in the future um, also try to you know, spin up other things with them. So that being said, um, I don't think Tim's going to talk to us today about stuff he's done out in the Aleutians. I think he's going to come and talk to us stuff uh, a little closer to home in California, but I'll let Tim uh, give this um, what he's going to do. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here again and see a lot of familiar faces. So um, I always like coming all the way down the road, only two or three hours from Santa Cruz now. Um, yeah, so today I think I am going to um, talk to you uh, mostly about California work. And although the subjects um, I'm going to be talking about, which are sea otter of ecosystem effects, are that, that general subject is something that was investigated extensively in Alaska, um, both the Aleutian Islands, uh, Southeast Alaska, later on um, by some of uh, Jim's other students in British Columbia. And so really it's some of the, these general ideas of sea otters as keystone predator come to us from the north. Um, and here in California, well, in, in general things are a lot more complicated. You know, on every front things are more complicated here in California. And um, we've been looking at sea otters and the nearshore ecosystems that they live in for, for a while now. Uh, for the last um, 15 years or so, we've conducted a really detailed and comprehensive set of studies of sea otter population biology and behavior, diets, foraging ecology, um, and ecosystem effects um, at different locations in California, from, from really the north end of the range, uh, just north of here, right down to the south end of the range, including San Nicolas Island. And we've studied, and in that time, we've learned a lot of things about sea otter behavior that, that makes us look at their ecosystem effects in different ways. And one of these is, and I guess if there's one word to describe that, it's the word variation. Sea otters do different things in different areas. And so a one size fit all, fits all model of their behavior or of their ecosystem effects turns out not to be very useful. Um, so while the general sort of keystone picture that you, you have heard about and learned for, from Alaska is a very useful starting point. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, we've learned that we really kind of have to dig a little bit deeper um, based on some of what we've learned about uh, sea otter behavior. Actually, I don't really need to stand there at all, do I? I'm going to stand over here. Um, OK, so keystone predators, um, a textbook example. Um, I, I, this is moss landing, so I can go over this pretty fast. I think all of you have uh, probably encountered this at some point in your studies. Sea otters eat a lot. Sea otters eat a lot of, um, well, not of everything, but they eat a lot of invertebrates. And in particular, they eat a lot of macroinvertebrates. And in um, northern areas, particularly in the Aleutian Islands, the most, is there a laser pointer here anywhere? This looks like it could be one. Well, it doesn't really matter. You all know what an urchin is. There you go. You found the bottom button. OK. Right, so you go up to the Aleutian Islands to a place um, where sea otters are not, and you will see lots of this on the bottom, pretty much everywhere. The, the habitat is relatively similar across the entire Aleutian archipelago. Um, and then if you go to a place where sea otters are in any significant numbers, and you go down, you don't see this, 
you see that. And basically, the idea is simple. Otters eat a lot of these, an awful lot. We've considered, like we calculated for the population around one island, Amchik Island, they eat um, God, 20 million or so in a given year, the population there. And it's enough to restrict um, of urchin abundance enough that um, the dominant kelp there, Alaria, can grow into um, forests. So the functional role of sea otters is pretty well under described in those habitats. Um, based on a lot of um, both field natural experiments and actually um, controlled human regular experiments in Alaska and British Columbia that have pretty much shown this effect to be pretty robust. But what about other locations and what about other habitats? Um, this story has largely been told around the green sea urchin um, Alaria habitat um, and also and then lesser so in uh, British Columbia also some macrocystis and other kelps. But um, and actually, Jane Watson, a student of Jim, has done some really beautiful work looking at um, kelp successional stories in British Columbia. I'm not going to go into today. Um, so we're interested in, though, in there, how there's the, the sea otter effects might vary from habitat to habitat. Um, okay, yeah, so the story in, in the Aleutians, actually, I think I just told it all. Um, in 1740, otters occurred pretty much everywhere throughout southwest Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. Um, then this fur trade happened. Um, by 1911, otters were pretty much gone from this entire stretch. They'd been hunted to virtual extinction. There are a couple remnant colonies to believe, believe to be here, here, and here, um, based on the patterns of spread. After that, they were protected. Um, over that century, they expanded and recolonized all of the islands that they'd been extirpated from. By 1970s, um, otters were present everywhere that you see um, yellow here. Otters were present at varying de densities. This island here, Amchika, they were present at, um, they were already believed to be at equilibrium abundance. They'd been at a constant population for about 30 years. Um, and they were just arriving at Atu Island. So if we, we had this natural experiment of otters at equilibrium abundance at Amchika, and then this other island where they're present at very low abundance, just arriving. And when you look at the habitat, you saw um, at Amchika Island, incredibly low urchin abundance, really high um, kelp abundance. And at Atu Island, you saw the opposite. And in fact, 30 years after that, actually 20 years after that, um, a huge sea otter decline occurred throughout the entire southwest Alaska, and this experiment reversed itself. All the islands that otters had been abundant at um, and that were kelp dominated um, very rapidly transitioned back to an urchin dominated state. And so now if you go to the Aleutians, that's all you see. So that's all I'm going to talk about Alaska. I'm now going to come back down here closer to home, to California. Um, here, there's a very old debate. and um, there are people in this room, I'm, I'm told, who were part of that debate. Uh, and, and it was, a, you know, actually it was a very good debate because it was th this question. There was this paradigm that had been established based on experience in one place. And the question was, how generalizable is that paradigm um, throughout the entire North Pacific that sea otters occur at, given that there's different species down here. There's different species of kelp. There's different species of, of invertebrates and different species of fish. Uh, and there's different habitats. And so there was a lot of uh, papers. Um, presenting, sort of arguing this one way or another. And, you know, to some extent, it was never, it's sort of more the, the debate kind of moved on. It wasn't really resolved. The fact is we have otters in parts of California. We don't have otters in other parts of California. And, and this general debate kind of um, largely went away. But the question still remains, what are sea otter effects on their ecosystems, and how do they vary from place to place? Is it a constant pattern, or is it a pattern that we need to look at um, on a case-by-case -case basis? So. Here in California, we do have another one of those wonderful opportunistic experiments. Sea otters were translocated to San Nicolas Island as part of the uh, recovery strategy. Um, sea otters are threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And it was ascertained based on um, some modeling and also based on some huge oil spills that occurred in other parts of the world that the entire population of otters was completely vulnerable to an Exxon Valdez scale oil spill. One oil spill that size would wipe out the entire population. And so it was thought it would be really good to have an insurance policy somewhere. And San Nicolas Island was selected as that place. It seemed like it was, it was known that they'd been there um, based on archaeological evidence, had the right type of habitat, and it was spatially distinct from the mainland population. So that translocation occurred. Um, a bunch of other political things occurred that I'm not going to go into to do, have words like management zone. Um, I'm not going to get into that today because it doesn't really pertain to our discussion. Um, so suffice to say, a small po well, 120 otters were brought out there. Almost all of them left. Actually, all but about 20 left, and then that 20 declined to 12 animals in 1992. So it, was, they, it almost didn't make it, but then it did make it. Those 12 animals hung on, and then they began to increase. Those, they began to have pups. 
and the population for the last 15 years has grown at about 10% a year. So it actually doubles the rate of increase actually measured anywhere else in California. So it's actually now, although it was sort of deemed a failure, it is now actually one of the sort of beacons of hope in, in sea otterdom here in California. Um, and so the experiment that it was set up um, w was initially envisioned and that was sort of deemed a failure because the otters did not thrive is suddenly now an interesting experiment again. And so that experiment was the idea of establishing a long-term subtital and intertidal monitoring program before the otter translocation occurred in order to measure this sea otter effect and see how does this sea otter um, ecosystem effect work here in the Southern California kelp forest. Um, so that program began in 1980, pre-otter. Um, and it consists, that I'm going to talk only actually about the subtital portion, although there is an intertidal portion to, um, to all of this story as well that I, I won't talk about today. Um, so biannual surveys are conducted of kelp, urchins, and fish inverts. And those, biannual, those surveys continue through the present. And they've continued with the exception of a couple of times where we've missed a, a spring or a fall survey. We've never missed an entire year, but occasionally weather has shut us down for one of those surveys. Um, so it's now um, a really a valuable long-term data set on, um, on a subtitle uh, benthic community um, in, in the Southern California kelp forest. Um, th although, as, as mentioned, the initial expectation was that it would be a before or after of the otter experiment, and there was a long delay because the otters failed to, um, failed to thrive initially. Okay, so these are some of the, um, the folks who participate in this survey, and I'm, I would hazard a guess that there's a fair number of people in this room who have been out for at least one of those subtitle sampling surveys. Well, I know, I know at least a few of them have. It's up to a couple skiffs or something like that. But um, yeah, we won't get into those stories either. OK, so if you are interested in this sort of data set, you can actually have access to the full data set up until and we're going to try to, it's a, um, published now as an uh, ecology data paper, um, which means that it's online, the full data set and metadata are available. And we're going to try to update that every couple of years as we collect more data. So it's complete up to, I think, 2012 or 13 right now. And we'll try and stick the next two years on. So, have at it. If you want to do some modeling work, you can download the entire data set. And uh, um, all the data I'm going to be presenting today for San Nicolas, um, you have access to. So it's um, your basic, usual type of sampling, um, except that it's in a remote place. So um, the ship goes out twice a year, and um, all the, the usual sorts of shenanigans occur. Um, but the main thing is that uh, these um, sites are sampled uh, around the island. So these are these permanent sites. Um, a number of these are, actually now they're all doubled up because we just, we changed, we added new sites to the protocol. So at every one of these locations, Sandy Cove, West End, Dutch Harbor, Daytona Beach, and NAVFAC, um, there's now paired sites that are um, a few hundred meters apart. And then within each of those sites, there's long transects and quadrats, um, these permanent quadrats are, are measured and, and uh, swim, fish swims are done. Again, all the data, all the data are, are available from that data paper. Um, so we have these long-term data sets we can look at at varying spatial scales to look at uh, kelp, invertebrates, uh, and fish. OK, so at first glance, what do the data tell us? Do we see um, a really obvious sea otter effect? Do we see sea otters having that sort of trophic cascade that we expect from Alaska? Um, as mentioned, initially, um, nothing really happened with the otters. They, stayed, they went to a very low level, down to about 12 animals. Um, but then they did begin to increase, and now we're actually up to, um, actually as the latest count, we're up to about 70 some animals, 75 animals, I think was the latest high count. Um, so it's been growing, it has been growing nicely. So do we see um, the expected decrease in urchins and increase in kelp? Um, and in one way, when you, when you look at the data from the different sites, mainly what you see is a big mess. You see um, a lot of variation in both kelps and urchins. Um, so here's from two different sites. Um, you definitely see some, some occasionally crashes in urchin abundance. In these graphs, actually, the urchins are green and the kelp is brown for reasons I don't know. Um, this was, uh, a postdoc did this. Um, so any event, <laughs> there you go. Or I, I, do, I always do urchins purple myself. But um, So you have crashes in the urchins. And when the urchins are crashed, you get spikes in kelp and, and vice versa. Um, but you don't see a real clear pattern that matches the otters, although in the, at this site here, you do see urchins staying low and kelp beginning to increase. So it's at first glance, when you look at all the sites from all the islands, uh, all around the island, you do not see that clear trophic cascade pattern that you're expecting. Um, OK, so we actually do know something, though, about spatial variation in both the predators and the prey. Um, we have also been conducting, um, well, initially four times a year, but now for the last five or six years, twice a year, we go out and conduct 
sea otter surveys and mapped the uh, distribution abundance of sea otters around the island. Plus, we conducted a four-year telemetry study out there um, in the mid-2000s. So we had really detailed data on habitat use and movements of individual animals and diets um, from that period. And so what that actually tells us, and here you, the brown dots here are groups of sea otters. And this is actually a couple years of surveys combined. But basically, most of their use is out here at the West End sites, the boilers, um, and these West End sites in Sandy Cove. Um, they do a little, uh, they do use to a lesser degree this area along sort of the south uh, west side of the island as far as Dutch Harbor. They virtually never use the north end sites. Um, and even here at uh, Daytona Beach and um, Dutch Harbor, they, they don't use those sites nearly as much as they use these west end sites. And our telemetry data showed exactly the same thing. Most of the foraging occurred out here. So that's important to know. When we look at the urchin, dis uh, urchin abundance prior to um, the translocation, so this is for the, for, based on this, um, the, earliest, the earliest surveys, we see probably the reason that urchins, I mean that otters have distributed themselves the way they do, and that is they're, located, they're foraging where urchin abundance was highest, um, and, and probably where productivity and recruitment of urchins was highest, and that's at these West End sites. Um, so although there are urchins all the way around the island, of course, there's much lower urchin abundance along those North End sites. Um, so it kind of makes sense you know, where the otters have located, but what is amazing is the degree to which that whole population now of 60 animals is really limited to just really one side of this island, which is only about 10 kilometers long. Okay, so here now if we look at, we divide up the population trajectories to north, um, northwest and south, we see that most of the population increase has been relegated to the west end areas, and essentially there's been no growth in the north, and occasional use um, forays of otters into the west end, or the south sites, but not very much. So we would only expect to see, see our predation effects at the western sites, less so at the southern sites, and probably none at all at the northern sites, given the, um, given the distribution of otters and where they're foraging. So we can now look at, um, let's look at the, uh, the patterns of urchins and kelp um, at these different areas. So it's the north side, where we have the low otter effect, there's been essentially no increase in, in the otter effect. And what we see is this um, high variation in both purple, uh, uh, red urchins and purple urchin abundance with no, no clear spatial trend. Like we, had, we do not see a decline in either reds or purples over time, although do we see this variation. And we, there's various bits of evidence and a couple papers written that suggest that these, some of these really big crashes are disease-driven driven crashes. So, so urchin disease that, um, that spreads really rapidly throughout, um, particularly when urchins are at a high point and spreads rapidly throughout the population and then we get a crash similar to what's happening in Southern California right now. So we have a, a, this sort of um, pattern where you have these disease-driven crashes and a lot of variation over time. Oops, and no obvious relationship between otters and urchins, as mentioned. Okay, now let's look at the West End sites. Um, and here, and again, you'll, see, you'll now see why I've been separating out the red urchins and purple urchins uh, into two separate graphs. So what we see at the West End sites is the beginning of a, a decline for red urchins in the mid-1990s, which has continued um, well, through the present, so red urchins at the western sites are now at very low, um, very low de densities relative to what they were in the 1980s. Um, for, the f for a long time, there's really no obvious relationship between the otter, otters and purple urchins. Um, but then after the last crash that occurred in around 2000, purple urchins never did recover at the western sites. They did recover at, at the um, northern sites and the, west, uh, the southern sites, not at the western sites. And this is where I'll, I will allude to the intertidal data. They did recover in the intertidal sites where otters do not forage. So, so the, the purples have bounced up everywhere except for the West End subtidal sites. So, and for that and a number of other reasons, we believe this at this point is an otter effect. And I'm actually going to show you one of the other reasons. So red urchins declined by mid-90s. Purple urchins stay abundant until early 2000s. In the mid-2000s, we conducted this tele telemetry study, as I mentioned, and what we saw was a diet dominated by red urchins um, by far, uh, by far last, and this was across actually all individuals in the population. We, had, we actually had about 60% um, of the entire population tagged at that time. So all the animals are doing the same thing. They're really hammering red urchins. Um, they are also eating kelp crabs, um, also some larger, um, some larger snails. They are eating some purple urchins, but not nearly, uh, nearly so much as the red urchins. And this actually made sense. We actually also did some, um, some bomb calorimetry and measurement of nutritional content, and it actually completely makes sense that one red urchin in, in, uh, um, accounts for 
um, I don't know if it's tens or hundreds of times the number of calories as a purple urchin. So it really, it does make sense if you're calorie limited to feed on red urchins first. So that's what we actually think exactly happened. Otters began to prey on red urchins initially and probably hardly um, preyed on purple urchins at all, or certainly not enough to make any sort of an effect. But only once, um, when red urchins had been brought down low enough and they began to finally increase their uh, purple urchin, their diet, and when purple urchins were brought down to a low level for um, probably, again, disease-driven reasons, um, otter, there's enough predation now to keep uh, um, purple urchins limited at this one site. And then what, we saw, then what we see in response to that is actually a pattern that mirrors, um, mirrors some work that's been done in British Columbia. The first thing to respond is the macrocystis. So after that crash in 2000, we see at the West End sites um, this, the, this increase in macrocystis that actually is sustained for the first time. So for the next five to six years, we had high levels of macro. And then the macro begins to tail off, and, which is initially kind of puzzling because urchins had not, did not really increase that much. But then when you look at what's going on in the understory kelps, it makes more sense. This, and this is the pattern that was reported in British Columbia too as well. After otters recovered, um, recovered at a site, initially you have macro, uh, the, the canopy forming kelp dominating, but then over time, understory kelps can outcompete um, these the canopy forming kelps. And we begin to get a really solid canopy low down of these understory kelps and also fleshy red algae. So, that, so the understory kelps and fleshy red algae are now currently higher than they've ever been at those West End sites um, throughout the entire um, sampling period. Um, so, that, uh, so that is very interesting. Otters have initial effect on the kelp abundance after 2000, once the, only when the purple urchins are brought low, and then the understory kelps increase dramatically. And that, that's where we are right now, actually. Okay, so that's going that's to now, that's enough data for me to start um, arm waving. So that, you've seen the data part now. Now here's the arm waving part. I'm going to suggest to you what we current, our current kind of working hypothetical model for the food web interactions at San Nicolas, um, which is a little bit different than um, the, food, the sea otter food web models from Alaska. So bef when otters are missing from the system, um, what you have is a, is a system, at least well, at, at, the, at the rocky subtitle sites, that are largely dominated by the dynamics of red, both of two species of urchins, both red urchins and purple urchins. And, um, this is, um, to some extent, a disease-regulated system. So sometimes there's a very strong effect of disease on urchins, but most of the time there's a very weak effect of, the, of disease on urchins. So disease is not a particularly um, effective predator most of the time. Um, and so when, when the both reds and purples are dominant in the system, they effectively limit macrocystis, and they effectively limit understory kelps and fleshy red algae. So there's strong top-down um, effects of urchins on those species at that time. When otters come into the system, what happens? They initially exert a very strong effect on, on red urchins, not so much on purple urchins. Um, once they get abundant enough and they begin to, they, they sufficiently control both reds and purple urchins, then and only then do you get an, an initial increase in macrocystis. Um, and then over time, as, um, with a reduction of urchins, then the competitive effects um, of understory kelps begin to, begin to become important and you can, get, um, you can get the understory kelps becoming more dominant in the system. They support a lot of these kelp-dependent invertebrates, which could secondarily lead to increases in fish populations, and that we'll, have to, we'll have to see how that story plays out um, over time. And then, of course, otters, as urchins are reduced, begin to broaden their diets and include some of these invertebrates, particularly the larger snails which we see, and kelp crabs, which we see in their diet a lot. So that's our working hypothetical model. Time will tell. We now we have the opportunity as they spread to these other sites to see if this effect is replicated. So, um, so stay tuned. Our next steps actually are to, we're, we're trying to spin up another study at San Nicolas to look at changes in both the distribution and diet um, as the population grows. Um, now seems to be the critical time because they're sort of t in that in that part of the exponential growth curve that we can, we're finally going to see some, um, some movement around the island. Um, we, I have a, a, st a student right now, actually, is going to be starting um, PhD up, actually, at Oregon State University with Mark Novak, but it's going to be, his PhD will be based at San Nicolas Island, he's going to do some experimental work to look at habitat effects, how they may, might mediate these um, food web interactions and indirect effects, um, and also do some modeling. He's very interested in doing that, so that's actually something we would like to do, is to div put together our data sets with some of the other data sets in Southern California to, um, and do some serious food web modeling. Um, and the, the ultimate goal is to begin to have some 
means of understanding the process and perhaps forecasting some of the community dynamics we might see with the return of sea otters to Southern California, um, including quantifying some of those ecosystem services uh, that you read about. Okay, so that's Southern California kelp forest. Very different than an Alaskan kelp forest. There's definitely, we see strong sea otter effects, but they're much more localized than we expected. And they're more complicated largely because of um, two species of urchins rather than one species of urchin. Okay, so what about other coastal habitats? Not all of California is dominated by the rocky subtidal. There's, um, there's huge sandy embayments, and then there's coastal estuaries. And as you might guess, since we're talking about sea otters, another opportunistic experiment um, that presented itself, and that is sea otters moving into Elkhorn Slough. And in, the pa in, in their spatial pattern of range expansion, they started from Big Sur, and so out of all the various tidal estuaries in California, the first big one that they encountered, actually I'm gonna Minus Morro Bay, which I'm going to leave out for now, and maybe I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that over beers, perhaps, because um, Morro Bay is a little more complicated. But the first big one that they hit is Alcorn Slough, and they hit it um, in about the mid-1980s. And actually, I'm going to, this is my reminder to tell you, a lot of you are going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to go rather quickly over some of this because probably most of you saw the talk by Brent, yes, um, here um, some weeks ago. So I'm going to actually... Um, talk about some of the same patterns, although I'm going to take a little bit more of an, um, an otter's eye view of the system. Um, but, I, but hopefully most of you have seen, uh, seen Brent's really cool work, experimental work in Elkhorn Slough. Um, so, yes, yeah, Seattle colonize, uh, colonization Elkhorn Slough, they first moved in in the mid-1980s, though not in any great numbers. Um, the numbers began to increase in the mid-1990s through the early 2000s. This increase here, this was almost entirely, though, transient males. So males who um, spent part of their time in Elkhorn Slough, did a lot of their foraging actually outside Elkhorn Slough in the Monterey Bay, although they definitely were foraging within Elkhorn Slough too. Um, but the, the key thing is they were not a full-time resident population. Um, that began to change in the, mid in the 2000s when females began to move in and stay in. And at this time, we actually now have a fully resident female-dominated population um, within the slough. We, we're currently, well, I'm going to show you some slides here. We're currently t um, tagging these animals, and none of the females that we've tagged have ever left the slough. So that, that's a, it is now a very interesting, completely resident um, estuarine population of sea otters that's very different than the outer coast um, population of sea otters. So, um, so we've definitely seen some changes both in the abundance and kind of the behavior, um, the behavior of sea otters over that time. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so first of all, we have the trophic impacts to, uh, the, um, to Elkhorn Slough. Uh, from, the, from the 1990s through 2010. So over that period of time, we actually had been um, following a number of uh, otters that were tagged in the slough. Some of these were otters that were actually from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They were rehabilitated otters, released in the slough and stayed there. So we had a chance to monitor data from known individuals. Uh, plus, we were also just opportunistically collecting data on, on non-tagged individuals as well. So we have a pretty good data set um, of the diet of sea otters over that period of time. And the main thing you see there is that it was over that period of time, and this is on a per biomass basis, not on a per, per occurrence basis, their, the, their dietary biomass was dominated by cancer crabs, and actually mostly by large cancer crabs um, over that period of time. So, like cancer, uh, so cancer antenarius and cancer productus. Um, so what we see, uh, what we saw over that time was a pretty strong top-down effect of sea otters limiting these large crab populations. Um, so the, here's data on crab bio, biomass before, 19, in the 1970s, and in 2005 to 2009. And when we look at the um, mean size of those crabs, even a more dramatic effect. So they reduce the abundance of cancer crabs, but particularly the largest size classes of those crabs. Um, but, and this is going to seem familiar after what I was just telling you about, um, about San Nicolas Island, which is actually about, interestingly, just about the same size as um, Elkhorn Slough in terms of the overall length, those effects were not uniform throughout the slough. And this, this is going to be a recurring theme, actually, is the more we've learned about sea otters, the more we've learned that they are extremely habitat specific in how they forage and in their spatial ecology. Um, and so, in fact, the, um, over that period of time, sea otter abundance and foraging was, uh, occurred primarily in these two locations. Um, there was a little bit of foraging up here beyond Seal Bend. Um, they didn't forage much at all here, and there was very low abundance there. Um, so the, the, we would expect that any, their effects on the crab populations would also be, be spatially heterogeneous. And in fact, they were. So when we look at the crab biomass density at sites um, 
at different sites within the slough, we see a strong relationship between the crab biomass. Um, this was, again, from the, from the mid to late uh, 2000s, uh, and sea otter density. Um, same thing in terms of the crab size as well. Where, where sea otters are spending most of their time and foraging the most, um, they reduce both the abundance of crabs and the, si and the size classes of crabs. Um, and this is the part that you've saw, seen, already seen from Brent, so I'm going to go over it quickly. Um, crabs, it turns out, are really important uh, great, uh, predators on some of these meso grazers, um, particularly sea hares and isopods. Um, and so when we look at the, the biomass of these grazers as a function of otter density, we see the same sort of an effect, um, that the grazers are most abundant where otters are most abundant and where crabs are least abundant. Um, these grazers are important, gra uh, important grazers on the algal epiphytes that grow on seagrass. So again, where otters are most abundant, crabs are least abundant, the grazers are most abundant, and we see uh, very low levels of algal epiphytes. The only place we see um, a high level of algal epiphytes are on the seagrass beds where otters aren't spending any time. And all this translates into an effect on the um, above ground biomass and below ground biomass of seagrass. So sea, the seagrass was basically at its healthiest and most abundant in the areas that sea otters were, um, were using the most and where, again, they had the strongest top-down effect on crabs. And thus we have this sort of somewhat strange four-level trophic level, a uh, four-trophic level um, cascade in Elkhorn Slough, completely unexpected and not what we would have anticipated based on what we know about sea otter foraging elsewhere. Um, and, and we really have no idea at this point whether this is um, extrapolatable, if that's a word, to any other estuary besides Elkhorn Slough, um, that, that will, remains to be seen. Um, but based on both the, those sort of um, correlational data I just show you and a lot of experimental data that um, undoubtedly Brent presented to you a couple weeks ago, it seems pretty compelling that, that that did happen in Elkhorn Slough. Again, this is the time series um, that probably you saw already, but that basically um, the abundance of eelgrass is more or less tracking the abundance of otters over time in the slough. So, so that's sort of the story up until um, a few years ago. In 2012, we began um, a radio tagging population study of otters within the slough that I've, I've mentioned a couple times. And uh, at the same time, um, Brent and other researchers um, uh, at Long Marine Lab and actually at Esner and, and, and here, I believe, um, began to look at some of, the, um, some of the other potential effects of sea otters as the otter population was increasing their habitat use within Alcorn Slough. So what do we do when we do a tagging study? Well, normally we go out, we initially capture some otters, and capturing otters most of the time is something we do using scuba equipment. Here in the slough, scuba equipment really doesn't work so well for capturing otters. It was a complete failure. So we either dip-netted or tangle-netted um, about 25 otters, which were brought back to the vet lab, were processed, um, tagged, a whole bunch of um, uh, samples were done for, look, to look at contaminant uh, exposure and disease exposure and a whole variety of other things, um, also body condition, and then they were released. Um, oh, yeah, so we, we implant the radio transmitters that we use to track them, and then we put on the visual flipper tags that most of you have no doubt seen, and then we monitor their, lo their, their spatial locations and their, their diet and activity budgets um, and obviously things like their survival over the next um, three to five years. And so we're, t we're two and a bit years into this study right now. So here's some of the, um, some of the locational data, um, and this is, actually, this is already about six months old, but ju this just shows you um, one of the first um, important things, in, and that is that sea otters spatially segregate um, habitat by sex, and this is something that we see in the outer coast as well. So males and females in general use different types of habitats. Um, and in particular, so, the, so, but you'll notice some differences in that. You'll also, you will see some green dots scattered here where the females are, and those actually are territorial males. Non-territorial males tend to be, um, spend most of their time in these large male rafts, one that occurs around the harbor and one here at Seal Bend. Um, they spend much less, they do, do a little bit of feeding up the slough, but they, they don't spend much time in the tidal creeks with the exception of these few territorial males. Females, on the other hand, are extensively using these tidal creeks farther up the slough. And this is something that's been changing over the course of the study. So we've actually seen their habitat use spreading up the slough over time. So this is just showing you some of the habitat, um, some kernel density um, analysis of the habitat use from our tagged animals, and looking to see how they um, use the habitat for different types of behaviors. So females with pups tend to use these areas, particularly around Yampa, Yampa Creek, extensively um, for resting and nursing. And they do do some feeding here, particularly at high tides when the pickleweed is flooded. 
then we see them foraging um, over the areas where pickleweed is. When they're feeding, again, there's, there's some, some feeding that occurs here at high tides, but a lot more of their foraging is either back in Parsons Slough or in the main channel, going um, up as far as um, around Hummingbird Island. Although, again, this is, a few, um, this is about six months old, and we're seeing more and more foraging farther up the slough now. And when we look at the diet just from these up, um, upper slough animals over the last couple of years, we actually see something that's quite different. Cancer crab is, hardly occurs at all in their diets up here. We see a diet that's dominated by clams, um, but we also have a substantial amount of these small and ID'd crabs. And I say un would because when we're doing the observational data, anything, any crab that's smaller than about this, we can't really get a really solid species identification, whether it's pachygrapsis or hemigrapsis, or even a small cancer crab at that distance, and they also eat them so fast. So you can tell it's a crab because you see the little legs going like that but you can't tell what type of crab it is. And so we're actually currently conducting some scat analysis to try and get a handle on what the breakdown of species are. Um, that's still underway, but for a variety of reasons, we suspect that a very large proportion of that are these guys, pachygrapsis. Okay, so pachygrapsis are these short crabs or burrowing crabs, um, and they do a lot of this, um, a lot of tunneling in the, uh, in the salt marsh and pickleweed. And this is sort of the, the uh, and I think Brent talked to you a little bit about this. This is, again, experiments that are underway. But the early effects suggest that areas um, that otters have not reached yet or areas where that are experiment, otters are experimentally excluded, um, we, the pickleweed is in consider measurably poorer condition with less biomass than areas that otters are using um, or, that, or pr procedural controls. We don't exactly know what's driving this. We certainly know that they are that the uh, pachygrapsis abundance is um, strongly and significantly lower in the areas that otters are using. So that's probably the mechanism has something to do with that, that they're reducing the pachygrapsis abundance. But we don't know um, exactly how that is me translating into this effect on the pickleweed, except that it seems to be based on um, two years of experimentation. OK, so that's, um, that's all the story I'm going to tell you right now about um, Elkhorn Slough because it, well, first of all, you've already heard about it from Brent, um, but also it's really an experiment that is just getting going. Um, it, and we're seeing the changes before our eyes. Um, the, but there are some, I think, some consistent messages that come across from both these two case studies, San Nicolas Island and, um, and Elkhorn Slough. So first of all, in kelp forests, um, the effects of sea otter recovery definitely include um, greater primary uh, uh, greater, what the heck is greater primary productivity, uh, species diversity. These are some of the, the general um, effects that we see as part of that urchin tro uh, kelp trophic cascade um, potential. And this could lead to a variety of other ecosystem services. Um, as you can see, I haven't looked at this slide for a long time. So I, this is just as much a surprise for me as it is for you. <laughs> um, and there have been a variety of some of these uh, indirect ecosystem services that have been suggested. And that is things like increased nursery habitat for fish, Increase shoreline stability via more consistent and larger kelp forests. Increase levels of carbon fixation, um, for instance, are some of the things that have been um, discussed and published on. At seagrass, um, it looks like sea otters, as they are in other places, are very good at reducing um, the, uh, the dominant uh, macro, herbivore, or macro invertebrate, which in, in Elkhorn Slough originally was, um, was large cancer crabs. Sea otters did reduce those, and that facilitated grazers and seagrass beds. And at least in Elkhorn Slough, looks like it indirectly has a positive effect on eelgrass health and, eelgrass and, and the recovery of eelgrass beds. Um, and we don't know whether that's going to occur in other estuaries, but we are conducting experiments to try and, um, try and tease apart some of those mechanisms. Um, so there's positive effects for eelgrass res um, resilience. In salt marshes, this is something that's really just happening right now as sea otters begin to are using the salt marsh habitat more and more. It looks like they are able to reduce um, burrowing crab populations. This has the potential to reduce bank erosion and marsh loss, um, but again, exactly what those mechanisms are, uh, we don't really entirely know yet. Um, the, some of the consistent thing, messages we see here, though, that are that otters do have pretty strong and cascading ecosystem effects, but these effects differ from habitat to habitat, which, I, which apparently is the first bullet point. Um, so another, something that's, I think, very interesting to me um, and I think we need to, we really need to factor into sort of these models. The, those early trophic cascade models, you will notice, are wonderfully and blessedly space-free. Space never really enters into them. It's sort of, you have your food web, you have your model, and space is alluded to at best. 
as you know, there's places where otters are and places where otters aren't. Um, but I think we really actually have to more realistically and effectively include space into these models because otters are not using space in a uniform way. Um, the sea otter trophic effects can and do vary at very small spatial scales, and that, that was the case, or is the case, both at San Nicolas Island and in Elkhorn Slough. Um, a, these apex predators, such as sea otters, can have very large ecosystem effects, and some of these ecosystem effects can affect both um, the functioning and the res potentially the resilience of ecosystems to larger scale perturbations like climate change, ocean acidification, and there's a lot of work to be done in, in that area that, um, that I'm pretty excited about doing. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope our studies will inform managers about some of these direct and indirect effects of sea otters in different coastal habitats. And with that, I will say thank you very much to both um, the funding agencies, um, and these are the funders just for the San, some of the San Nicolas Island work, some of the major funders over time, but there have been many, and obviously um, a long list of people who have contributed to the collection of these data, um, data over time. This is really just a, um, a tiny portion of those people um, who have been out for multiple times, but it's, um, it's an enormous list. And uh, yeah, work of this scale and that uh, over a, 40, a 35 to 40 year period requires dedication of a lot of people. And, uh, and I, I, I definitely walk in their shadow. Um, for Alcorn Slough, a different source of funders, a different suite of key collaborators. Um, and again, this is, this is some really exciting work that's still in progress right now. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to even just have a small part of it with the, with the sea otter work. Um, that's it. Questions? <laughs> yeah, Mike. Yes. Uh, so and I can see at San Nicolas <clears throat> that you can make pretty robust conclusions based on the direct effect on the urchins. But when we start to get to things like the secondary end of indirect effects of kelp core stabilization on kelp crabs, fishes, etc., mm -hmm. and then the otter's prey switching, yeah. how much of this can you disentangle from the fact that now those organisms might become more abundant because of the enhanced kelp core stability? Or are they being preyed on simply because the urges are becoming low abundance? So I mean, how much is driven by the habitat and how much is driven by the need to just eat? That's exactly where experiments have to come into. I think, I think you hit the limits of what you can do with correlational trend data um, pretty fast at that point. I mean, it has been argued you, can do, you can't do anything with trend data, right? And, but the problem is if, if you take a complete defeatist attitude, then we can't study sea otters at all because we actually, no one's going to let us for, with the exception of San Nicolas, pick them up and put them somewhere else. But, so I think we, we do, you can get a fair distance with the correlational data, but I think, and that's where actually I'm, I'm really excited about some of the next stage to happen. This, this student actually will be um, working with Mark Novak is gonna be doing exactly some of those um, manipulative experiments. Uh, so our exclusions and also um, and manipulating habitat, if we, assuming we get all the necessary permits and the Navy lets us do that, but to try and tease apart some of those mechanisms. I think experimentally, is the only way that you can do that because there's, as you say, there's just too many other uncontrolled factors. So do you have a gut feeling though whether or not um, they are, if they were to feed only on urchins, they are becoming resource limited then and, and are having a need to diversify the diet? That's, uh, they, they weren't during the time when we were there. Um, we both, um, that is the mid 2000s at that time. But of course the population was only 30 then. Um, so that's, that's why I'm trying to convince the Navy that now would be a great time to, um, to find another sea otter project out there. Um, because I, I would expect, about now we would expect, we'd start to see diversification of diet, at least at those West End sites, although the subtitle works says there's still a buttload of urchins everywhere else around the island. So that question of will we start to see those otters determinedly staying only there and diversifying their diet, or will they start to be, you know, ideal free distribution and start to move around and use other areas of the island. And there's, right now, just with the survey data, there's, there's only a limited amount we can do with just survey data. We really need to all the market animals to, to get a handle on that. That's a great question. Yeah. I was curious about the relationship you kind of said, Nick, where the services <clears throat> go down, mattresses went up, and then mattresses go down, and I mean, are you implied that some kind of competitive thing going on? Um, That's our movement, but yeah. yeah. Really, it's really been documented in California. You know, I mean, all around Monterey, there's tons of cows and tons of other stories. And I'm wondering, maybe it's an artifact of the way you count them. You, you, you've got an individual who want to address that. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's, where, that's where we need Karen here um, to answer, answer the, that question. But he says that um, 
and, and he's been doing it since the beginning, but he's never seen understory, the understory kelps anything like, like they are, you know, super abundant in a way he's never seen, basically. Well, that could be true, but you could still have. But not to the effect that they're actually, yeah, 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 shaving out the macro systems. Great big plants. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, um, the, the degree to which there's a competitive relationship between the understories and the macro systems, that actually has been shown fairly compellingly in British Columbia, um, based on, on, again, on these sites that otters arrive at in the, cent the center of Vancouver Island, where over time there, there is that, and, um, that effect, and, and after 20 or 30 years of otters being there, it's dominated by those un understory kelps, and the original, the original kelps, that, um, the canopy forming kelps, are, are less abundant than they were in sort of the transitional phase. But again, that's a totally different system. So at San Nicolas Island, I don't know that that is the mechanism. That, that, that as I say, that was definitely the arm wavy part of the talk. Um, it is definitely interesting, though, that you saw that initial, you know, initial spike for a few years and the macro seeming to make sense, and then, you know, it's going down. But the fleshy red algae and um, what are some of the the the, 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 the uh, understories that are dominating there at the west end? Center. There's there's a lot of there's the kelps out there. There's our clones. There's all that yeah. area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess yeah. 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 yeah, typically if you go to an area and remove urchins, how do you do it? Yeah. You get, you get massive kelp and Right, right, right. right. You're very high densities. Yeah. Right. But a lot of little plants. Right? Yeah. And slowly over time, nothing else happening, though. They, right, right, yeah. yeah. So you get to the original but and the whole biomass and productivity probably affected going up, even though the density is going down. Yeah. I, you, you know, I do know that Mike is somewhat perplexed as to why macro is going down. Um, he, he entertains the um, competitive one, but he's, he's obviously not hugely enamored by it. Um, he, so I think that, can, that remains a mystery moment. We'll have to see over time. Does it, does it just come back up again, or does it stay low? Um, oh, and for that matter, whether this sort of current explosion of the understory kelps and fleshy red algae also stays high, or whether, you know, whether that's a trend. I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not necessarily about numbers. Right, right. It's about cover, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about size and biomass. Yeah, yeah, biomass and, 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 well, and cover and shading. It, it, it is those things, I know he said, and those are the West End sites, they are the dominant cover, like there's no bare space. It is, so it's not, yeah, I don't know if that's percent cover or, and actually those, as you say, those, those graphs were unitless graphs. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but I think on a percent cover basis, there's pretty much solid cover now. Of, um, like there's, there's not a lot of bare rock. But again, if you're measuring that in the understory, yeah. the macro system is affected with it. Yeah. Is, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, as I say, there's a lot, a lot that were in those graphs. Yeah. Have you guys tried to use any of the you know, satellite derived estimates of kelp biomass to get a better handle on whether, you know, what's happening in the west? Yeah, yeah. The is really is that that a kelp? Um, that, <laughs> that was supposed to be part of that cameo project, and um, and hasn't been at least yet. Um, so, so no, except that we're trying to, I know we, um, we want to get a hold of those data to, to start to do that. Um, but again, now that those, that all of these data are out there available, um, we're also extremely hopeful that others will, um, others will seize that and, uh, and run with it, basically. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, now that there's the algorithms to actually estimate biomass and not just canopy cover, um, it gets a lot more useful. And actually, I did, I did get a hold of it. Actually, no, you mentioned I just haven't done anything with them yet. Yeah, so no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt. Tim, I was interested in when you looked at the West End where they had really high densities of urchins, and that was this idea that the, the otters went there because that's where the food was. And I started thinking about, well, what happened at the site specifically? But uh, if, you, if you can address that, then you address that to the, at the, all the different sites, do the urchin numbers track each other in time, or are they decoupled? They are decoupled at, um, <laughs> it's all a question of scale. And that's what, that's the, that's the befuddling thing about that data set, because you can look at it at so many different scales. Some of those, those big crashes are, um, <coughs> are consistent around the entire island, actually. Um, and so there is a lot of correlation in those. But the, a lot of the finer scale stuff seems to be decoupled. So those, the big, and, and like that, that big pattern that I saw showed what were both the reds and purples, that only occurs at those west end. And it occurs at bur both the west end sites. So it's consistent at those two sites. And actually at Sandy Cove, but not at any of the other sites. Um, but yeah, that tr looking for any sort of consistent patterns at all the other sites has been really frustrating because 
it's really hard to find. Even the, even the sort of the expected <coughs> uh, correlation between the kelp abundance and urchin abundance. So there's just there's just a lot of noise in the data, so we haven't really come up with a, a very effective way of analyzing that yet. Doug. In the SLU, have you done any modeling on what the carrying capacity of sea otters is? No. No, we're actually just starting to, um, the next step, um, or I, we're looking for students actually to take on this next step, is to develop a quantitative food web for starting with the eel grass system initially and then maybe get some more. But, but the answer is no, we haven't. And, and it, I wouldn't even have it, I guess, because it's such a transitional system right now. Um, so knowing what the long, they're, they're, what the long term um, sustainability is of those plant populations is really what's going to determine it. And there, there's an effect, you can see it, that it be, um, that there's a, the clams are getting smaller up in, as far as sealed end. They're definitely smaller than they were, but they're still eating a lot of them. I mean, there's tons of foraging happening there. It's just instead of getting, you know, this sort of Washington clams are getting this sort, and they're still getting the, the monster, you know, bigger ones farther back up as far as, you know, hummingbirds. So it's, it's really this kind of system in transition. If we think of this more like a Southeast Alaska system, what it might do is get up to really high numbers and then crash down and eventually reach a lower equilibrium. That's sort of that's been a trademark of some of the soft sediment systems um, in the north. And that would be a, you know that so that could happen. You could get up like 200 and then it drop down to 50 or something. But that's that's total I'm thing. I have no idea. Do you have an estimate for uh, San Nicolas? What carrying capacity is? It's much more similar to the central coast. Of if it's much more similar, yeah, then it should be around 400. Like 380 to 400. Yeah, so we're still well below it. Yeah, and that's the, that's that's applying the density. Not even that's actually the lower density than um, from Monterey. That's sort of the average of rocky subtidal habitat within Central Coast. We apply that to the amount of habitat. There's a lot of habitat out there. And at 10, percent you're looking at decades to get to that number. Could be, although as I say, they're finally they're sort of in that you know they they went from 30 to 80 really fast. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens, but. There's, there's definitely, then there's the question of emigration, um, which is, you know, definitely happens. And, and the question of what, what island is next, which, you know, all, all money is on San Miguel, but um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. I'll come back, I'll go one here and I'll come back to you, Mike. Yeah. I have a question about what's happening with the year five, since the uh, supplies have come back to New England, we've seen an like, increase in the version of abundance because that's where they have refuge from the honor. Does that have an indirect effects on algae and the that's actually real, that's a really interesting question, um, and I don't know the answer to that. Except I only know the other end of the end, that equation, which is that it, they don't seem to be using it at all. Um, we have very little shallow foraging, um, or most of their foraging is, is in deeper subtitles. So we actually had timed after quarters in a bunch of those animals, and they actually their their use of feeding habitat is considerably deeper than it is in other areas. So, for whatever reason, they they really don't seem to be using either the inner tidal or even the shallow subtitle. Um, as much there, and I, so I do know that was one of the one of the first things to, that um, that we looked at when we were wondering about those purples was did they they recovered everywhere except the West End sites, and so we looked at the sub, we looked at the inner tidal and they did recover there, so it was just at the subtidal sites that they that they didn't bounce back up. Um, so as to the second part of your question, though, whether these, there's indirect effects um, on kelps and things there, I, I do not know. There are some people looking at. Um, that and particularly at the abalone out there as well. So another that's not another part of our long term data set um, is um, worth looking at. And Mike, you have another question? Yeah, I was always <coughs> kind of curious about the Lucy Lad. You know, our great crews out there, one of Jim's crews, and we sample all the north you know, sides. <coughs> but all the sites we sample are on the north side. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, given your idea about what you're finding about sort of the site specific nature of what I would do. What's the south side of the Houston's like? Are the effects the same? I mean, is it really fair to characterize this as an Aleutian Island effect? As being, as being uniform? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, the vast majority of the sites are on the north. There are a few, there are some areas where there's some south side, south side sites. We're actually hoping to sample some more of those this year because at this point, I, I didn't, didn't talk about the Aleutians at all, but at this point, it's such a different environment. Basically, otters are gone from almost everywhere, except these little nodules of persistence. And so any effects that they're having now are going to be incredibly localized, like within a couple kilometers. And none of, it just so happens that none of the long-term sites that Jim set up happen to coincide with those areas. So what you see from those long-term sites is just solid urchin there. 
but they could be actually having some pretty strong, very localized effects on urchins, really close to those nodules of persistence are what we call them. So we're gonna try and set up, some, and some of those are in Pacific sites. So, so that gets to your question. We're gonna try and set up some sites to look at that. I don't know, Matt, what do you, do you have a sense? We've got a few of the, um, of the Pacific yeah, sites. Yeah, and, and it's the same thing. You yeah. know, but, um, and then here I am. <coughs> That's what I was thinking about, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and on some of the smaller ones, like Stugul and uh, Angel and stuff. Right, yeah, yeah. Both sides. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. It is, I mean, it's, there's a reason for, <laughs> for that bias towards the north side is that it's just generally more sheltered. And, okay. yeah, no one wants to go up there. Anyway, you know. <laughs> it's, it's but also, you know, when you get way close to the you get the wave failure. So yeah. We vote, we don't, you know, maybe five or ten percent of the sites, you know, a very small number were on, were on that. Mm -hmm. um, south side. Yeah, yeah, south side. And they were, with the exception of some of those ones with big beds around the angle up there, most parts of mostly they were barrens. They're barrens. But there are, you get, you do get those, you know, that's where it's sort of, not stuff, but there are these, you know, when you have a lot of sand around the rock, you, have an you know, there are, and, and or a high pinnacle where you get the whipping effect of kelp. There's definitely mechanisms that do allow kelp to persist in small areas. Um, but at this point, it's, it's usually like one or two stipes surrounded by lots of urchins, basically. Unless you're up on it. Yeah. On it. And then there's some places that just have beds, and we, they look like everything else that should be around, but they're not. Yeah, well, so, the south side of Amchik is on it. Mm. You know, there's sites there, but we, that's the one of the only places we can't count otters, because there remains these isolated, long finger reefs surrounded by sand, and probably it's <coughs> very hard for urchins to get out there, and they continue to sport. That's one of the only places you will find consistent kelp canopy. And it's miserable. We're trying to survey that because it's just, yeah, even now you like, you follow your problems and you can't do it. So yeah, so there are there's there's reasons that they will persist, you know, other than uh, um, other than an otter event. But, uh, yeah. But we have telemetry data from there too. And when you go back and look at that, otters, same thing. Otters everywhere have this very have very small home ranges. Um, that's and they will move between areas and actually there's a um, Emily a student. Is Emily here? Then, okay, there was a student here of Jim's who looked exactly at this. And so and to try and you know, ascertain what makes them move from area to area. But even within that, there, those areas are not that far apart. So otters have, um, yeah, highly localized effects, at least at the individual level. That's it. All right, thanks very much. Thanks.